ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience. I apologize for this little delay. I would like to welcome you warmly here in the Polish Embassy. It's not the first time that we're organizing an event in partnership with the, with the Embassy. Uh, this is the ninth in the series of the Jagiellonian Lectures, and we've been invited to host an event here uh, three times. It was Sir Leszek Borysiewicz from the University of Cambridge, we had the pleasure to, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Ambassador Witold Sopkov, uh, um, had the pleasure to deliver a lecture, a Jagiellonian lecture for us. And now uh, it's uh, the turn for Dr. Kunicki from the University of Oxford. I would like to ask our hosts, Your Excellency, for a short introduction to us. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my great pleasure to host another Jagiellonian lecture here at the Polish Embassy in London. Uh, I would like to welcome you all here and uh, share my deep conviction that we are ahead of a very interesting, fascinating lecture. Uh, our today's guest, uh, Dr. Mikołaj Kunicki, Director of the Programme on Modern Poland and St. Anthony's College at the University of Oxford, will speak on a very intriguing subject, uh, that is teaching Polish history abroad. I'm very glad that Dr. Kunicki has agreed to give a lecture at the embassy, as I know that uh, many, not only Polish, but also British people, are interested in the program implemented by Dr. Kunicki and sponsored by the Oxford Noble Foundation. Taking this opportunity, uh, I would like to congratulate Dr. Kunicki on taking up this new post at Oxford University and ensure about the embassy's openness to cooperate as regards the promotion of knowledge about modern Poland. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Cicero said, Historia magistra vitae est. This sentence, fully true in my opinion, implies why the way in which history is taught matters. The issue is of great importance, indeed, particularly in a globalized world marked by global exchange of views, common access to information and knowledge, as well as by massive migrations. Nowadays, it is not possible to avoid transnational references when teaching history of a state or of a nation, but it does not mean that the issue is uncontroversial. I have no doubts that the lecture by Dr. Kunicki will constitute food for thought for historians, diplomats, uh, Polish Saturday school teachers, students, Polish community activists, and for all those interested in history. So I wish you a very inspiring lecture. Uh, I, I'm sure we will have a very fruitful discussion. And uh, let me welcome once again Dr. Kunicki. Thank you very much. This is a great honor for me to be here. And uh, this is also one of the uh, starting engagement I'm having actually outside of Oxford uh, regarding my uh, current, uh, current position. Um, and, uh, let me start actually with the, with the, with the personal anecdotes and, and, and probably I'm going to use actually quite a few um, uh, during, today's, uh, during today's lecture. Um, when I was preparing actually this uh, this talk, um, I decided to I decided to use one of my uh, colleagues uh, at the European Studies Center, Dorian Sink, um, who recently uh, received her PhD in Oxford as my guinea pig. Uh, so Dorian is an American, and her uh, field of expertise is essentially we uh, welfare policies and. They impact on the Roma populations in southeastern Europe and Romania especially. So I simply ask her this specific question. If you had a chance to take a survey course on 20th century Poland, why would you do it? Okay. Well, she answered, because I am interested in the region, the Second World War, and the Cold War. Um, and I think that um, this brief exchange uh, really illustrates uh, quite well some 
promotional, <laughs> if you allow me, features of a history of Poland in the, in the 20th century. Uh, there is no doubt uh, that the country is usually associated with World War II, uh, the Holocaust, and the Cold War uh, divide. But Dorian also signaled another important uh, factor. Uh, her emphasis um, on the region of Central Eastern Europe really indicates a transnational approach toward teaching and learning uh, history today, particularly when it comes to studying a history of small and medium-sized nations. And to put it bluntly, um, Poland is not USA, Russia, Germany, France, United Kingdom, or even Spain. Um, that is essentially great powers of the past, present, and perhaps future, uh, that uh, have shaped the course of modern European and world history. On the other hand, and I don't mean to patronize members of other nationalities here, Poland is not Belgium or Slovenia. Okay? Um, in the last, what is, particularly, what is particularly interesting about Poland is that, for better or for worse, um, in the last century the country was the unfortunate laboratory uh, and playground of fascism and, and communism. Uh, thus, non-Poles are often drawn to Polish history in order to study wars uh, and conflicts. Uh, the Cold War uh, generated significant interest in, in, in Polish studies due to the country's presence um, in the Soviet bloc, but also due to the reputation of a rebellious uh, uh, satellite for which the Poles worked very hard. Um, but this magnet, um, this, this Cold War interest, um, has faded away uh, after the collapse of, uh, of communism. And thus the million dollar question is how to attract foreigners to Poland's history, culture, uh, and society. And before I move to historiography, I would like to talk a little bit about technical, almost mechanical challenges um, uh, which we, that is people who are teaching Polish history, have. First, Polish language. Um, it is difficult uh, and its knowledge should not constitute a precondition for studying Polish history. That was very often the old-fashioned model in the past. Uh, you are going to do Polish studies, whether this is literature, whether this is philosophy, whether this is history. You have to take a very intense three, four year old long uh, a course in, in, in Polish language. The sad thing is that even now, um, textbooks actually for teaching Polish um, are less than perfect. In fact, I think they are actually quite dull. So anyway, we have to, I'm afraid, toss away basically this uh, the specific, uh, the specific requirement. But what university instructors must do is to offer a pronunciation guide from the start. Otherwise, students will struggle with surnames, geographical names, and will not necessarily recognize them at lectures and seminars. And we must also remember not to subject them to the barrage of names and dates, which was the way of learning history in my school and university days in Poland um, in the 1980s. But here is essentially the example of uh, ad hoc made transliteration of what is really otherwise a very difficult name for non-Poles actually to, uh, to pronounce. Prime Minister Stanisław, Stanisław Mikołajczyk, no reason basically to to, to, to explain for me how did I come with all these uh, strange sounding nice, but when you actually read them, they make, perfect, uh, they make perfect sense. By the way, this is the only slide actually in this lecture which contains transliteration. I'm not going to do it. Um, another technical obstacle um, involves uh, primary sources um, and their availability um, in English. Um, while there are quite a few uh, volumes of translated and edited uh, documents or even memoirs, um, historians of Poland must be ready, and this is a surprise perhaps for some of you, to act as translators or interpreters. 
And I will always, um, I will always remember um, my lecture on literature in pre-war Eastern Europe when I had to translate from the scratch one of, one of the poems of, of Józef Czechowicz at the, was, at the Warsaw Central Railway Station. This is very unfortunate, but there are essentially no English language translations of someone who is definitely one of the most accomplished Polish poets uh, of the 1920s, but particularly 19, uh, 19, 1930s. But translating his poem is not enough in order actually to give him a true, a true tribute, I had to pair him with someone coming from a different country uh, who essentially shows, you know, uh, lots of similarities when it comes to the use of language in a very innovative way. Young age of death um, and the country uh, which also has a limited lack when it comes to the translation of poetry into English. And I'm talking about Jozef Otina, uh, the great Hungarian um, poet uh, of the 1920s and 1930s. Fortunately, in this case, uh, the poem uh, uh, of Jozef Otila was available um, in English. Um, one of the ways to, to, handle, to handle the shortage of translated primary sources is to utilize Polish fiction, novels, and short stories, and there are indeed many of them um, available in, in, in English. Um, a historian lecturing on the condition of Polish arts or literature in a specific, uh, in a specific period should be able to discuss um, uh, 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 Polish books or visual arts in the context of cultural studies. Uh, it is not enough to praise the genius of Witold Gombrowicz and Tadeusz, and Tadeusz Ruzewicz. Um, we must essentially discuss them within such conceptual frameworks as modernism, perhaps surrealism, uh, uh, theater of absurd, or existentialism. Um, we can't take for granted that students will recognize these terms. And I'm speaking out of experience after spending 15 years in the United States when someone actually approached me after the very same lecture and asked me what other works did this guy Kafka write. Um, in other words, we need to learn, we, I mean the historians, we need to learn the basics of literary analysis and art history. It's better to start with talking about Proust, Joyce, or Kafka before jumping into the world of Polish, uh, of Polish literature. Um, documentary and feature films are also of huge help. There is this uh, cheesy, corny slogan uh, which basically says, you know, uh, cinema has only international language or cinema is international. Well, in fact, this is the case. Um, fortunately, the sustained interest of film scholars in Poland's cinema and the increasing release of Polish films with English subtitles in Poland make the employment of movies uh, easier. But then, uh, and here I speak not just as a historian, uh, but also a practicing film scholar, uh, we cannot fall into the trap uh, of merely comparing the content of history textbooks with what we can see on a movie screen uh, to pass our judgment on historical accuracies and inaccuracies. Consider one of the movies actually by Andrzej Wajda, Lotna, um, which contains the famous scene showing basically the Polish cavalry charging German tanks. This is one of the films which, needless to say, contributed against the intention of Wajda to the myth that indeed in 1939 the Poles were uh, uh, charging against the German tanks. But then the question is basically what what, what Vida wanted to say and convey in the case of this movie. And here we basically have to go to the, to the basics, you know, of, uh, of film studies um, and, um, uh, and, and uh, more cultural, uh, cultural approach. Because we should always remember two things about future fi uh, feature films. First, they convey an artistic vision of filmmakers 
Secondly, uh, cinema, good or bad, or perhaps particularly bad cinema, um, uh, is the barometer or seismograph of society and various discussions and trends uh, which are consuming essentially, um, which are consuming essentially a, a given Mm, a, a, given, a given society. So instead of asking the question what we can see on the screen, we should add a word which is really quintessential to historical craft, um, that, is, that is why. Um, here is another example, basically, coming from Andrzej Wajda, uh, the memorable shot from um, Ashes, uh, Ashes and Diamonds. Ashes and Diamonds, which after all these years, is still very often the most known Polish movie outside of Poland, uh, the movie which is considered to be a masterpiece, and the movie which essentially is largely responsible for making Andrzej Wajda the Polish national um, um, filmmaker. I have taught on this movie a number of times, and it's a very challenging film. The repository of, 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 uh, uh, of various you know, visual symbols which uh, 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 can actually give a trouble for the Poles to interpret them, not to mention basically foreigners. But here comes exactly the convincing nature of the work of a, of a filmmaker. Again, if you look at this, at this, specific, at this specific shot, um, at the background, we basically have a pile of wreckage, ruins, which essentially already indicate that this is the time shortly after the disaster. Um, at the middle plan, we basically have two protagonists, Christina and Maciek, and Maciek looks again as if he is Hamletizing. Okay, serious things are really discussed. And on the top, at the first plan, comes essentially a uh, uh, topsy turvy um, um, uh, figure of, of Christ. Now, what does it symbolize? Well, obviously, you know, um, um, those who are actually informed about Polish national mythology, uh, 19th century romantic messianism, would essentially say, okay, this is really, you know, Poland as Christ of, as, as Christ of nations. But then the question essentially is why the Christ is, is hanging, you know, with head down. Um, and I think that really actually gives you, uh, gives you some, some, some idea that even Vaida, the most Polish, actually, of, of these Polish directors, um, um, who is so recognized, actually, worldwide, worldwide um, he must be basically analyzed, you know, um, in the context of such trends in the history of cinema as Italian neorealism, that goes particularly well with the first of his two films, but particularly Generation. Uh, how about the French existentialist cinema of the 1930s? He never hided the fact that Marcel Carnet is one of, his, one of his masters, just like he often, very often praised the master of surreal cinema, Louis Buñuel or uh, Akiro uh, Kurosawa. And I spent so much time basically talking about text uh, as, well as, as well as cinema and the use of other uh, artistic uh, materials because for the, for, the, for the plain reason, the knowledge and understanding of culture um, is a prerequisite for studying distant people and societies, even in our global um, um, westernized, westernized world. Uh, apart from linguistic and artsy gymnastics, uh, we must be ready to use cultural, cultural codes, metaphors, and other channels of communication familiar to non-Polish audiences, especially at the lower level, at the lower level uh, of academic uh, education. Plain and simple, very often we have to tap um, into pop culture and pop conventions. Uh, so consider the example uh, of the term which is really coming from the field of economy, shortage economy, gospodarka niedoboru in Polish, as it was coined by the Hungarian economist uh, Janusz Kornai, uh, while he was essentially describing really existing socialism and the economy of shortage um, in, the Soviet, um, in the Soviet bloc. But I think it's better to use um, um, Slavoj Zizek, uh, Slavoj Zizek, a pop star in philosophy, 
um, who really knows how to attract broad audiences to serious uh, subjects. And, and Zizek essentially uh, defines shortage economy as the economy of happiness. Um, now, obviously, when I, when I tried actually to convey what Zizek meant, and he's a, he's a Lacanian philosopher with neo-Marxist bearings and a very complex personality, sometimes it really felt like hitting actually the wall. Okay? So I decided actually to use the Rolling Stones to my, to my, uh, to my, to my rescue. And I usually illustrate uh, Zizek's take by inventing the following tale. I usually pick up one of the students in the room. Mm, there's going to be Raphael today. And um, let's say that Raphael lives in, lives in Poland in 1971-1972. He listens to, on the occasional basis, he listens to Radio Luxembourg. And then on Radio Luxembourg he essentially heard, you know, the songs coming from the new uh, album by the Rolling Stones, Beggar's Banquet. Now, obviously, he cannot go to Empik or other uh, uh, a bookstore in Poland those days in order to buy Beggar's Banquet. Okay? He's not able, basically, to tape it from the radio because uh, there are no really tape recorders in Poland at that time, in 1971 or 1972. But there is a way, actually, to acquire uh, uh, this cherished, you know, uh, uh, this, cherished, this cherished object. Apparently, Rafał knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who is a Polish sailor working for the merchant navy. And this guy is supposed to go to Denmark, to Copenhagen, in three months. And obviously he can essentially buy, uh, he, can, he, can, he can buy the album uh, of the Rolling Stones for, for Rafał. Uh, of course he's going to make some profit, right? So Rafael basically spends, you know, two or three months, you know, collecting enough money that he can deliver enough hard cash uh, to the Polish sailor. Everything goes according to the plan. The Polish sailor goes to Copenhagen and he gets him um, um, beggar's banquet. But then Rafael puts basically beggar's banquet on his LP player. The needle is broken. Economy of shortage, right? He goes to the service station, and of course there are no needles for LPs. Well, why don't you show up, you know, in four days? After four days, is it the question of four weeks? Then he starts actually having nightmares about, you know, months. Uh, but then he gains actually contacts to someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone. Essentially at a certain point, and this is a shadow economy, uh, in addition to the economy of shortage, he's able to put beggar's banquet on his LP player, and he is so happy. This is the happiest moment in his life. Hence, shortage economy as the economy of, uh, uh, of happiness. Now, let me move, to, let me move now to, to historiographical um, uh, challenges. Um, I think that while, while teaching a history of Poland, um, we, can't, uh, we, can't we can't afford a narrow uh, nation state uh, perspective. Um, Poland really needs to be contextualized and discussed in a broader picture. Uh, that of Central European and European history. That of its complex relationship with German and Russian neighbors. And um, within, um, uh, within, within global, within global uh, uh, framework. Um, in nationalist and patriotic narratives, each nation claims to be uh, exceptional, right? But in our case, this uniqueness is largely irrelevant for foreign audiences. Why the Poles are so exceptional? And that can really open, actually, the whole Pandora's box. Because some people may say, well, they're exceptional because they're anti-Semitic. Others are going to say they're exceptional because they are devout Catholics. Uh, someone else is going to come with another, with another, with another issue. So, just to, give you, just to give you some example, um, the story of World War II and something which I have worked on uh, 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 quite a long time ago, uh, the issue of collaboration. Okay. Um, Poland and the Poles, quite rightly so, claimed that that was the only country in Europe without Quislings, 
that is without basically collaborators who were acting and were, sub were acting with the consent of the Germans and were actively supported by the Germans. It is true, but it doesn't mean that there were no Poles during the Nazi occupation who were not willing to collaborate. Władysław Studnicki, for example, in 1939-1940 uh, was petitioning Goebbels and others and was trying basically to create essentially pro-Nazi organization, uh, a far nationalistic right organization, and he was even calling for the creation of, uh, uh, of some forms of Polish armed forces. But nothing happened, you see? Uh, the Nazis didn't listen to Studnicki. So he was a sort of unwanted collaborator. So rather than basically, you know, sinking into the self-congratulatory mood, saying that we are absolutely the best and the most holy people in the world, perhaps we have to look at the other side. What did the Germans want? And they didn't want collaboration. Now, why they were so savage, basically, in treating the Poles during World War II? Well, this very question brings basically comparison. It's not enough basically to, to, to say that they were motivated by their racist doctrine and they uh, uh, particular disdain for Slavic people. Look at what was going on next door, the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, um, which was one of the less affected countries and societies in World War II regarding not just casualties, but also economic economic destruction. Um, look at the places which at a certain point decided actually to go together with Hitler against, against the Soviets, Hungary or Romania. Or you can look at some other Slavs, uh, Mr. Pavelic and Croatian Ustasha. You can't really have actually anti-Eastern European or anti-Slavic anti -Slavic bias being fully responsible for the mistreatment of the, of the, of the Poles. Which brings me again, you know, to the story. If you want to understand what was going on, read, for example, the diaries of Goebbels. Go and study, actually, German archives. Follow all these exchanges, basically, which, um, uh, which took place between people from the, from the, for example, German foreign ministry on one hand, uh, Nazi party organization, or perhaps the German army. We need, basically, you know, the whole of the story, not just essentially solve a congratulating, self-congratulatory mood that we were essentially the only country, uh, the only country without without Quislings. Another important uh, example, which um, concerns actually 1989, and we very often are 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 uh, uh, are, are disgruntled and sad, and 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 sometimes you know uh, um, appalled by the fact that everybody is talking about. The Berlin Wall, the Berlin Wall, the Berlin Wall. But nobody's talking about round table. Okay, well, these are two different things when you look actually at the symbolical values, the wall versus the table. The Berlin Wall had been at the attention of the world since the moment of its construction. Quite recently, or just right now, uh, this is basically the anniversary of the assassination of JFK who was one of the very first people to bring the wall into this long, uh, uh, into this long uh, uh, metaphorical existence. It's a very catchy uh, media, media symbol which refuses to go away. But then there is also something else when it comes why the table does not matter that much than the wall. The wall symbolizes upheaval, revolution, emotions. A table is a negotiation table something definitely less glamorous. But I think, uh, and, this is my personal, and this is my personal opinion, which you, don't have to, which you don't have to share, is that perhaps something more could be done right after, after 1989 to, 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 to say more about you know, the, act of, the art of compromise and the glory of the, of the June 4th um, national elections um, in Poland. I still remember a great poster Solidarity managed to pull out with, with Gary Cooper, uh, 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 the, the picture taken from, from the movie High Noon. Uh, there is obviously Sherry's badge, but there is also Solidarity badge. And instead of holding a gun in his hand, 
he's holding a ballot card. Things could have been done, I think, in a, in a, in a better way. So let's not just blame the inertia, let's just not blame basically ignorance, which is all true um, regarding basically, you know, the cherishing of the wall and then completely neglecting, you know, uh, uh, the table. The Poles also have to do something uh, about this cons conspicuous lack of, uh, of presence. Uh, I also think that non-Polish historians um, of Poland, free from um, homemade controversies, loyalties, and myths, um, have greatly advanced our knowledge and understanding of Polish uh, history. Consider the works of my two esteemed colleagues and friends. Um, uh, Padraig Kenny from the University of Indiana in Bloomington and Tim Snyder uh, from, from, from Yale. Um, Padraig is a social, uh, social historian who nurtured his interest in Polish history as a young student in the late 1980s when he traveled to, to Wrocław. Um, he's the author of numerous books, including uh, his groundbreaking labor history study. Uh, uh, the title is Rebuilding Poland, Workers and Communists, 1945-1950. And I think instead of tapping into the high politics of the Cold War, Kenny focuses on the experiences of workers in Poland on the ground um, from the end of World War II to the onset of uh, Stalinism. And what Padraig is also doing in this, in this book, and this is quite highly symptomatic, is that he completely tosses away uh, Zbigniew Brzeziński's rigid totalitarian model for post-war Poland with its emphasis on high politics and political repression. Kenny is not denying political repression, but he argues that to some extent, workers were not helpless victims of an omnipotent state and a diabolical ideology, but resourceful shapers of their own destiny, able to turn a system to their own advantage and lessen its crueler aspects." End of quote. He also did something regarding basically the retreat from high history, uh, which, is really, uh, which should be really praised, microhistory. So essentially, studying the everyday life, not, as, not the contents of party speeches, you know, or uh, other elements of, of high history. He was extremely busy actually doing his research not only in the New Documents Archive in Warsaw, uh, IPN was closed those days, um, but uh, local archives in places like uh, Wrocław, uh, uh, Wrocław and, and Łódź. And then consider his next book, A Carnival of Revolution, Central Europe in 1989. Another very, very eclectic, very transnational, the first one was not transnational, this one is transnational, account on the 1989 revolutions in, in East Central Europe. He picks up, essentially, he focuses on grassroots movements that took off in places like Poland, Slovenia, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Ukraine, GDR, um, in the mid-1980s. His thesis is very controversial, which I don't fully share, but he claims that considering uh, uh, the, the, the peak of social activism, from the people who are military conscientious, who are conscientious military objectors, who are environmental activists, uh, who are Polish anarchists, who are crazy artists from Neue Slovenische Kunst, that perhaps we should somehow make some changes regarding the date of the glorious revolutions. Maybe this is 1988, he says, rather than the glorious and very much media-watched events in 19, uh, 1989. Very interesting take, thought-provoking, and again, you know, multi, uh, multi, multi, multinational, transnational, but also extremely eclectic when it comes to research, because essentially Padraig utilized an anthropological model uh, of a Russian scholar 
Mikhail Bakhtin and his theory of carnival, which is coming from the literary studies. Now, what about Tim Snyder? Um, in his reconstruction of nations, Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania, 1569-1999, um, Tim Snyder traces the emergence of four rival modern nationalist ideologies from common medieval notions of citizenship. Um, he presents the ideological innovations and ethnic cleansings that abetted the spread of modern nationalism, but also examines recent statesmanship that has allowed national interest to be channeled toward uh, peace. And in this book, Tim Snyder was able to do something which some Polish historians perhaps were not ready to do or not willing to do. He brought to light the critical importance of two schools of thought on Polish Ostpolitik, Eastern policy, reconciliation with, 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 with Eastern uh, neighbors, including Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania. Uh, the first group essentially being um, Jerzy Giedroć and the Kultura Milie, uh, Paris-based, uh, and particularly the work of Juliusz Mieroszewski, who was Giedroć's really uh, so, uh, chief strategist, actually, when it comes to foreign policy matters. And then uh, Tim essentially was among the first scholars um, to catapult into historical prominence uh, Polish foreign minister Krzysztof Skubiszewski, and particularly his very sophisticated policy regarding um, uh, the treatment, the Polish treatment of what was and what was about not to be um, Eastern Soviet, uh, Western, uh, Western Soviet republics of Belarus, Ukraine, uh, Lithuania, etc., etc. Um, I always find it actually quite ironical that uh, these contributions to the organization of a new uh, European order, in a good sense of this word, were really highlighted first by an American historian uh, who comes from the uh, uh, family background of hardworking Quakers from Ohio. Um, and um, you can find basically, you know, a number of other examples of the fantastic use of this uh, transnational and, and, and multi-methodological uh, 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 approach. Uh, Kenny's and Snyder's books are thought-provoking and they go beyond the tight corset of martyrdom, dull historicism, and Cold War constructs. Um, here, part of innovation stems from from methodological approach. And I do believe that it is social history, uh, nationalist studies, intellectual history, gender studies, uh, which are sometimes brought you know, in a completely different context in public uh, in, um, in, 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 in Poland that can really attract foreign audiences rather than high political uh, uh, history, biographies of famous figures not to mention uh, settling the scores or competing for exceptionality um, with, with, other, with other nations. And what Snyder reminds us is that ethnic homogeneity is a relatively new phenomenon in Polish history, regardless of self-ascribed ethnocentric visions of national identity, uh, national, ethnic nas national identity which really originated only um, in the last two decades of the, of the 19th uh, century. I'm obviously talking about modern Polish nationalism in its post-romantic uh, in its post-romantic phase. Um, mm, um, uh, so, you know, this is something we should, we should, we should definitely keep in mind. And um, we should also remember that some aspects of Polish nationalism, namely its ethnocentricity, um, were greatly re-entrenched uh, under communism following border shifts and ethnic cleansing that swept Poland during and after uh, World War II. But in other words, you know, I don't think that I'm risking that much to say that Polish communists actually somehow in a nightmarish fashion realized basically the old call, the old Endek call, uh, Polska dla Polaków, Poland for the Poles only. 
Uh, this is something we should we should we should keep in mind the ironies of of history and the issues basically of historical continuity between what strikes us as completely different ideological and political um, political uh, uh, formations. Um, we should also keep in mind basically that uh, national identity is not given or inherited. It is very often acquired. It can be the result of a personal choice, political circumstances, and coercion or categorization by others, especially state authorities in what Eric Hobsbawm identified as the age of extremes. This is the case of the European Jewry and some of these people found themselves Jewish because the Nazis thought of them as being Jewish. This is the case of some people who had to leave Poland in 67, 68, 69 because it was Gomułka's regime and Gomułka himself telling them that you cannot have two fatherlands. Well, then you better, uh, then you better go. But regarding perhaps, you know, somehow, I don't want to say more cheerful, but, but interesting personal story, consider these two characters. Um, um, uh, Archbishop Andrzej Szeptycki and then General uh, Stanisław Szeptycki, brothers. But you can really see that one of them basically uh, 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 decided to, or decided, I mean, uses obviously, you know, we used Ukrainian spelling or transliteration of his name, whereas the other actually decided to stay with his, with his Polish name. Very interesting characters. In fact, uh, these two uh, were the grandsons of Alexander Fredro. Um, uh, young uh, uh, um, Andrzej Szeptycki, who was raised in the aristocratic family with Eastern linkage, but Polonophized, he was using mostly French in his home in the 19th century, just like his brother. And then comes basically a shock around 1880s when he chooses to pick up his national identity, and that is how he becomes basically Ukrainian, he becomes a monk, very much against the wishes of his, uh, of his father. By the beginning of the 20th century, he's one of the undisputed leaders, not only of the, of the Greek uh, Catholic Church in Galicia, but gradually he also acquires the position of one of the superior, sub supreme leaders of, of Ukrainians. Um, Stanisław Szeptycki, well, before he became general in the Polish army, he he saw a long service in the Austro-Hungarian army where he acquired the rank of a colonel, fought in the legions during World War I. But then in the 1920s, um, Stanisław Szeptycki really sympathized with, not to mention that he essentially joined Roman Dmowski's National Democrats, particularly due to his ardent opposition to Ukrainians, Ukrainian nationalism and Ukrainian influences. This is an extremely ironical take, actually, if you consider the fact that these two, uh, that these two are just, uh, were, were simply brothers. So rather than being a neatly set and rigid ideological canon, nationalism is an everyday practice and a living and evolving phenomenon. And I think that the magic term of totalitarianism and the Cold War mindset are not going to get us uh, anywhere. Communist Poland and other Soviet satellites offer, I think, a far more complex picture than that of Moscow's colonies run by ruthless collaborators who enforced the Kremlin uh, rule against the nations always united um, in enslavement and, and resistance. Uh, just like in my own work, I discovered that there were some people who took quite seriously the message of national communism during Gomułka's reign, and who applauded of what was going on in 67 or 68. But we also have some, some, some events, you know, which concern actually our, um, our southern uh, neighbors. One of the nations, paradoxically, uh, we sort of always competed against, starting in 1918, 1919, and even after 1989, for Western attention. No, we were the first. No, we were the first. We had Valencia, but we have Havel, etc., etc. 
Um, but um, uh, 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 the thing I would like to talk about is essentially, you know, the fact that within 30 years, and this is a very short span of time, twice Polish troops essentially entered uh, Czechoslovakia as, as aggressors, uh, essentially. Um, and, uh, the first action in 1938 was the act, was the sovereign act of the sovereign Polish state. Um, and the second stemmed from the Soviet supremacy, Brezhnev's doctrine, and also Władysław Gomułka's fear of a revisionist heresy beaming from Prague at the time of troubles uh, at home. But we should also remember that what matters is that the Czechs have not forgotten um, these Polish interventions, whereas sometimes we, I think, the Poles, try to relativize them, contextualize them, sweep them under, under, some, under, some, under some carpet. And I remember going to Czechoslovakia as a 12-year-old in 1981. That was the time of the Solidarity Carnival in Poland. Um, and even someone of my age was able to sense a lingering trauma in Czechoslovakia. It was a totally repressed society. Um, and, um, we visited my father's friend who was the director of the Anthropological Museum in the Beskidi Mountains on the, on the, on the Czecho-Moravian uh, uh, rather uh, side of the, of the border. We could watch actually Polish TV, which for the Czechs at that time uh, was uh, practically, you know, uh, uh, the embodiment of the freedom of speech or freedom of expression. The, the, the chief, uh, the chief uh, uh, the press and TV correspondents from the Czechoslovak mass media were tended to rely more on um, um, various um, 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 uh, splendid analytical pieces offered by Żołnierz Wolności, the soldier, of uh, the, the soldier of Freedom, the Polish Army uh, newspaper. But whenever we had to watch, whenever we watched essentially Polish TV, including the ceremony of unveiling uh, the Poznań Crosses, quite something, um, um, the volume had to be kept extremely low, the windows had to be shut down, um, and the curtains basically had to be drawn. This is the, this is the Czechoslovak society in the state of, of trauma. We encountered a number of reactions from bystanders when they heard Polish in 1981. Few of them actually uh, came with the words of sympathy, if not admiration, because of solidarity. But I have to say that I think more of them had more, uh, uh, her, uh, had more negative approach toward hearing Polish, actually, on the streets of Czechoslovakia um, 13 years after, uh, after, this, uh, after, after, after 1968. My um, concluding point is the lesson offered by Walter Benjamin um, in his uh, thesis on the philosophy of, of history. And, and Benjamin's 14th thesis on the philosophy of history says the following. Um, history is the subject of a structure whose sight is not homogeneous, empty time, but filled by the presence of the now, in German, jetzt Zeit. And I think this is a warning, actually, for, uh, for historians and non-historians that, just to paraphrase Georges Clemenceau, um, history is a too important business to be left to politicians <laughs> or politicized or political uh, historians. We have to always be aware that history books, monographs, and research should not be uh, done through the prism of contemporary politics, social debates, or conflicts. This is not going to lead us anyway. But why did I put basically this beautiful um, at the same time, rather funny-looking painting of, uh, of Paul Klee, because, among other things, Walter Benjamin was also a very interested and keen observer of artistic scene. Um, and here we have his description of Paul Klee's painting, Angelus Novus. And I will try to go slowly, because it's all packed with very important words. 
Angelus Novus shows an angel looking as though he is about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned toward the past, where we perceive a chain of events. He sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got, it, it has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. <laughs> Benjamin wrote these remarks in the 1930s, and I think these days we can be somehow more optimistic, but I think we should always keep in mind the words of this German philosopher, uh, mystic, and poet while teaching Polish and non-Polish history alike. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the inquiring lecture. And Dr. Mikhail Kulicki agreed to take a few questions from the hall. Could I get some water, too? <laughs> of course. We have some water here. I have a short question. Thank you very much for this most inspiring talk, but I found it also quite pessimistic. This is difficult, that is difficult. You need some knowledge of the language, and that's not easy. You need to know the peculiarities of the culture, all the specificity of the Polish nation, of the Polish soul, and so on and so forth. So I was wondering, what gives you most pleasure in teaching Polish history, if anything? And, uh, and if so, what? And what makes you proud, what makes you enjoy what you do? Well, in, in, in Poland, we, we, we used to have a saying uh, that pessimists are those who are better informed. So I don't know if that, that really answers you know, part, of your, part of your questions. I did mention specificities, but I, I, I don't want to convey, I don't want to convey um, um, pessimism. I, I, I think that, that for example, in, in this case, you, you can't simply expect, you know, rigorous uh, linguistic education. Um, uh, you shouldn't really, just like I said in my, in, my, in my lecture, I mean, it's better to come, you know, with two good names and discuss them, you know, in the context that brings non-Poles. Remember Józef Czechowicz and, and Józef Otila, the Polish collaborators and then what was going on elsewhere to open basically the window to, to somehow, you know, understand or let people understand that, yes, there are certain things which, which the Poles are definitely proud about, uh, but at the same time, um, we, are definitely, we are definitely not alone in this. Uh, you know, exceptionality is, is, is not a scene, the feeling of exceptionality, but then the problem is that others feel exactly the same way. The Russians, the Germans, well, the Germans for, <laughs> for the reasons, you know, um, which are not exactly the same, but the Italians, for example, and, and, and others. So, so it's not, you know, it's not, it's not to use some sort of historiographical Gleischachtung, um, but, but rather actually just to, just to, just to be fair and to, and, to, and to contextualize and contextualize and contextualize. When it comes to, did you ask me about the parts of Polish history I'm proud of, or, or things when I teach history? The experience of teaching it, when it's a message. Well, the, the, the definitely, um, um, definitely it's, the, it's the use of culture. Um, um, I am a big movie buff, and, and three or four years ago I decided that it's a high time actually to to convert, you know, my passion for cinema for professional <laughs> reasons. 
and and you know it's 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 really it's really it's a it's a great experience. It gives you really a great satisfaction with typical you know historical seminars you know or or lectures. It's a different story. They have essentially the set of books or articles to read. Some of them are going to get it. Some of them are not going to get it. Their motivations very differently, uh, very often differ. But my goodness, you know, if you have a kid coming basically from the middle of nowhere without any prior exposure, not only to Polish film or literature, but movies with, with, with English subtitles, and he can, he can make the best out of this, that, then, then, then I feel like I'm, I am ascending, you know, to, to, to paradise in this respect. And, and, and obviously, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a small word in a way. Um, um, we tend to know each other. Who is doing what in Polish history and where? On Thursday, I'm flying to Boston for the, for the Slavic Convention. And, and, you know, I'm going to meet a lot of friends and, 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 and we will be very busy exchanging, you know, numerous ideas about incoming, incoming projects, which, which are going to be very fascinating. And so this is a very gratifying experience, I think. <coughs> Again, for your most thought-provoking lecture, <coughs> which uh, returns to its title, it seems to imply a question: How should we teach or understand history, particularly Polish history, nationally or transnationally? Mm -hmm. And you also alluded to the question of uh, national identity as not being given mm -hmm. but acquired. Yes, acquired, but usually by at birth, with first words spoken to in a given language. Be it English or Polish, parents, family, the ambiance of the society, country you live in. In other words, it is both acquired and given. And there's nothing wrong about it. But it comes very close to the notion of, or to the concept of national or transnational approach. It seems to me, and I wonder whether you agree with this, that a Pole is almost biologically, a Pole Englishman. Uh, French, German, whatever, are almost biologically conditioned to write about anything from the person's point of view. And any historian would probably agree with this, that history is a process of interpretation, and not necessarily a relation of factography. Mm -hmm. So Paul writes almost with biological compulsion history from the national point of view. It's now a national history. And it is not the job of a Polish historian to look for so-called transnational approach. However, as you said, history is a compilation of various collection of facts. So Czechs, German, Russians, they derive their own history. Would you agree, therefore, that national approach to writing history is, equal, is <coughs> equally legitimate as the most so-called objective approach, mm -hmm. which is the other one, and therefore national approach should not be neglected, but transnational approach I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very valid comment, and I think you hit the nail on the, on the head. The, the, the question, the question, however, is you know, or the issue is that that you don't really have a uniform national approach, um, because sometimes. Yes, but you know the, the the problem. The problem is that sometimes it may acquire some 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 cartoonish um, characteristics. And 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 what I was essentially what I was going after in this lecture. One of the issues I was going after in this lecture is this is this uh, is this whole issue regarding basically how exceptional we are. And and you see you see my point. You see what I what I mean because. Uh, you know, it's always good to illustrate certain things. Okay, um, um, very often, not long time ago, um, if a foreigner would approach a relatively well, not maybe well educated by a Polish person, and asking the sacramental question, um, how was your family history like? You know what could be a standard answer, and I'm not saying this is the case these days, but, but I remember such cases. Well, including the, the, the history family, um, 
everybody will be fighting the Germans, uh, everybody would be sheltering the Jews, uh, everybody would be in solidarity or printing underground leaflets, and everybody saw alive John Paul II in those June days of 1979. Um, so, so, you know, these are sort of, you know, this is obviously the conglomerate of all these self-gratifying myths, which I would be very, very happy, actually, if they were not prevalent in the case of what we may call, you know, national perspective. Otherwise, you are absolutely right. I think the danger, actually, of, of transnational approach, not only in history, but, but in the politics, sociology, is to, is to overstretch certain uh, certain parallels and and I can definitely see it actually uh, uh, taking place we have another question and please raise your hand if you want to ask a question okay. uh, could we see the previous slide uh, the Polish army in 1938 um, this really should have a little bit further common trouble. Uh -huh. It should go back to the war between Poland and the Soviet invasion in 1920, where Poland was fighting the war against the huge empire and won. At that time, the Czech Republic... They grabbed this, the, the, this grabbed territory. The yes. Mm -hmm. So it really was a uh, return back to... Mm -hmm where we were in 1919, 1920. And, um, well, it should have been elaborated a little bit further. Okay, um, the, 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 there is a... There is a it would be about 1968, when the Polish Jews were the part of the Warsaw Pact. So it wasn't... Yeah. The, I'm sorry? The, well, that was... The Polish... There were, I, I think there was a, I think there was a fairly big yes, of course, and I mentioned Brezhnev doctrine and the and the Warsaw Pact treaty. But I was, I was, I was talking about these things considering the Czech perception. Um, and another thing, just to just to answer your comments regarding what happened, as a matter of fact, in January 1919, because this is when you have the brief Polish-Czech war. Uh, you are absolutely right about this, and this whole thing basically poisoned. Um, uh, relations between between the two states uh, during the interwar period, but there is such a thing as the Munich calamity, and I'm afraid that the Polish government joined actually the forces uh, it should really stay away from. One of the consequences, actually, of the fact that the Poles joined the partition of Czechoslovakia was that it really tarnished actually the Polish image abroad. Including this, including in this country, and including in France, and in other places. So, you know, it's it's not who started when and how did it go, but but there are certain, you know, there are certain there are certain uh, uh, actions, initiatives, um, which are definitely larger than life. And in this respect, Munich is basically still sitting, basically, you know, on 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 our shoulders or even on the on the on the shoulders of the Czechs. My esteemed friend Peter Zelenka, a very gifted French ma uh, Czech filmmaker, is actually uh, uh, writing a script for a, for a completely surreal comedy about the anniversary of the Munich Agreement. It's called uh, The French Parrot, because the parrot is the only one left who p participated in the actual negotiations in 1938. Now, obviously, I'm not trivializing your comment, but, but as I said, there are, there are, remember the Czechs, too. And, and uh, in, 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 in 1968, obviously, this is the Brezhnev Doctrine, this is the Polish participation, you know, in the Warsaw Treaty, but you also have, and here I would like to point to high history, um, very rich um, documentary record regarding Gomułka's very strong will to intervene. And again, he was not in a good company because the second person was Walter Ulbricht, um, to some extent, some Soviet leaders were more reluctant, whereas Gomułka was really pressing, actually, for a swift solution, um, um, even before, even before the, the, the Cherna negotiations, you know, in the summer of 1968. Why? Did he hate the Czechs? No. 
But you know, it was it was it was the it was the revisionist you know monster, which he Gomułka decapitated according to himself basically in Poland at the same time. So you've got the whole plethora basically of issues involved here. It's not just basically the Soviets, you know, telling everybody else, you know, let's go and, 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 and invade and invade Czechoslovakia. As you know, uh, the very uh, uh, unlike uh, uh, hero in this cabal is Nicolae Ceausescu from Romania, who refused to participate in the invasion of Czechoslovakia because at that point he was experimenting with his own road to, to communism, which was needless to say not revisionist, but at this not at this point, but later will become national national Stalinism. So, so it's all complex. But I understand. I understand your points and, and, and comments. Since, since the Second World War, <coughs> all the Polish, uh, all the historical departments in Polish universities, the majority of Polish historians, had to accept the Marxist principle that there is no objective history. There is no objective truth. There is only the history, interpretation of history, has to serve the purpose of the Communist Party. After 89, when party directed <coughs> disappeared or ceased, the proposed historians started to discuss, and still are discussing, what should be the uh, policy, this historical policy. A few weeks ago, we had the post a lecture by a Polish professor, a history professor, quite well known, who was saying that the government should determine how the history should be interpreted for the benefit of the nation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Today, we've heard that there is multinational, transnational, national history, not even once the fact was mentioned that there could be an objective. Uh, uh, Professor Polanski of, uh, of, uh, of the chairman of the uh, of the Polish Polish Jewish organization uh, asked during the last question, uh, what was the purpose of history? Said quite plainly, the purpose of history is to present historical facts to the best uh, according to the best knowledge, the best sources available. And I know that perhaps Polish historians go from go down to the principle that there is an objective history, there is an objective truth. And as Joseph Matkiewicz said, only the true history is interesting. Thank you. Well, thanks. Well, that's a that's a very lofty, uh, very lofty statement, including. Uh, Including, including the, 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 the cherished noble dream, essentially, as, as Peter Novik put it in his book, about the need actually to have <clears throat> objective history. Uh, the, the, the one thing we should, however, I think always remember about is that uh, there are facts, but the facts basically have to be analyzed. Too. And in order to analyze facts, we are going to create well, scientific, but nevertheless, storytelling. And stories are not growing on trees. Okay, that's why we have essentially this profession. And of course, all historians should essentially strive to present something which is which is uh, which is which is objective. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is no one history when it comes to methodology. And you know this thing very well that uh, we've got all these subfields. Um, um, which sometimes, you know, uh, uh, are not only causing actually pluralism, but, you know, cultural historians don't even want to talk, you know, to political historians. The, the, then here's a question, basically, of economic historians, because everybody considers them boring. You know, so, so, so there is all these things. So I would just basically say, you know, that, you know, I totally share, basically, this dream with you, and, and hopefully, despite having all these, you know, different highways, we will somehow manage to, to, to get to the destination we, we, we want. And I don't think that uh, 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 even a, 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 you know, legally elected democratic government should, should essentially prescribe you know, what kind of history should be, should be taught. 
universities and academia are autonomous, and we should stay this way. Who is a president of the University of Polish University? That is an example of what he was studying in his Polish school while he was attending Saturday Polish school. This was a very thin uh, Historia Polski, History of Poland, mm -hmm. small book, uh, Maria Uczkiewicz, Barbara Driscoli. Uh, the book was really fantastic, but this was not a book uh, which should exist. Uh, and the longer for Polish children. This, this was a book for uh, people whose uh, knowledge of Polish history was sufficient enough to, for revisions. So my question basically is, with regards to the national identity of Polish children who are in uh, Great Britain and uh, maybe in other countries, as we know, abroad, um, do you um, work on the uh, historical um, books? Do you? Uh, discuss the matter of national identity at history studies for Polish children uh, where, you know, in various universities or in the conference you are going to attend, mm -hmm. as you said, in Boston very soon. Uh, what is the, this is extremely important, uh, I think, uh, for today, as uh, what I think we have lost uh, possibly a generation, maybe more generations, you know, as the history hasn't been taught properly since the Poland joined the European Union, if at all has been taught. Mm -hmm. I'm not really. I'm not really sure. I can actually. I can really answer your question. Um, and and I want to avoid the impression that this whole task, um, which you envision, should be delegated to another branch of historians that is essentially historians of education. Um, there is definitely there is definitely a problem of, of of textbooks, not just outside of Poland, but I think in Poland too. Um, and and and. Uh, in this, you know, in this respect, I think, what can I say? It's, 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 it's very. It must be very often, and I know that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a. It can be sacrifice, and and and, but it must be also some daring act, basically taken by by people like you, who are sitting on the school board, um, who are active in uh, uh, Polish diaspora organizations, who are really keen. Um, to have good, decent history textbooks, you know, for, for their children, for, for the... I understand that, that, that your Polish children have been already born here or are raised here. Exactly. So, you know, um, praca organiczna, well, the, the, the sort of, you know, grassroots, you know, grassroots work. And, of course, you know, tapping into, into, already, into, already, existing, uh, into already existing resources which I think still should be expanded by such bodies like, um, like the Ministry of Education. I know that uh, a number of Polish research and uh, research institutions, including the, the Institute of National Remembrance, were conducting various you know, guest lectures for, for, for Poles abroad and for foreigners abroad, but this is not exactly what you are asking for. Um, so, you know, it's... I, I don't really know actually how to how to how to offer you more reassuring remarks, uh, and I and I'm sorry for this. Okay, we've got time for two more questions. Teaching Polish history in the national framework or a transnational framework was something that I've been dealing with since I was about Polska Maja Szczesna, that textbook the the lady was mentioning. I had the privilege of being brought up on that. It was a very national emphasis. Um, which, after a time, you reach a certain age, and you're, you're, you'll just start thinking in a more transnational way, global way, and that history, the, the national history, loses credibility. I'm now dealing with the Polish accounts. Now, I have a question that's asked to me, why so much myth mythology about Poles? <laughs> you know, the white horses, and, and <laughs> it's, it's very emotional, and it has to be, the national approach has to be emotional, and it has its place. And the transnational, has its place because we need the credibility. Would you not say that challenge is different rather than choosing between a national and transnational approach? The, the challenge is now to teach how to learn history 
rather than the bigger mm. No, that's a, that's that's a, that's a brilliant comment. It's I mean you you have already answered here and essentially you answered a rhetorical question um, in this um, in this respect. Why 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 methodology is so is so persistent? Well, it's very comforting. You don't have that much. You don't have you know you don't have German cars. You don't have French wine. And I'm just giving basically some hedonistic you know examples, uh, rather than rather than the scale of of, of of GDP, you know, and, 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 and things like this. But then you can always say that, well, but, you know, we defeated Budionde, right? And, and by the way, I, I, I was always laughing, actually, um, um, in the States, because Americans very often tend to use the word we, even though this is someone who was born, you know, 250 years after the, after the American War of Independence, right? Um, but sometimes, you know, sometimes there is a there is a moment of there is a moment of of of, uh, of awakening and, and, and sobriety. Uh, nearly 20 years ago, um, uh, when I was studying here in London, I had a friend from Peru. He actually knew quite a lot about Poland, but because he was interested in solidarity, and there were people in Latin America who were very avidly watching the developments. Um, in Poland as some sort of, you know, third road. Neither, you know, ultra-leftist, you know, Che Guevara style, nor essentially, you know, something authoritarian or neoliberal for, for that matter. So, so, so he was exceptional, but I remember when um, um, we started talking about uh, Polish, Polish 19th century history and, and what did I bring in terms, of, in terms of symbols and mythology? Samosiera. To which his reaction was, Polish mercenaries, you know. So, so I think I think you really I think you really actually grasp this thing, grasp this thing, grasp this fact very, very well. And and I and I second. It shouldn't be uh, national or, but but indeed it is essentially you know it is it is essentially at the the root of the matter to, to to, to demo demythologize in a way history. At least about this, I can be very clear <laughs> when it comes to um, when it comes to my own um, uh, pers personal uh, uh, personal personal uh, agenda. Not to diabolize myths and not to diabolize tradition, but let's try to sort things out actually and 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 keep certain things you know away from the from the from the canon, which 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 conveys national identity because some of them perhaps shouldn't be really there, or they should be treated in a different way. Another thing regarding, you know, um, the transnational, or I would say rather exposure to non-Polish histories. Um, what did I learn in high school, Poland, or even at the, uh, uh, at, the, at the Warsaw University in the late 80s or early 90s about 19th century history? There was this glorious moment of 1848. It didn't work. And then comes, you know, many years later, comes basically 1918. Poland regains independence. And uh, the Austro-Hungary or the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the, 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 the prison of nations is collapsing. Only in 1993, when I went to Hungary and talked to my Hungarian friends, I realized basically what kind of trauma was the end of World War I for the Hungarians, the Trianon Treaty, right? And they had a completely different narrative on the dual monarchy than we did. Okay, the Poles would say, yes, out of the three partitions, the conditions were definitely the best under the Habsburg rule, and it's true. But at the same time, you know, uh, this aspect of, 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 of European history, the history of the nation with whom we have traditionally long and good relationship was somehow missing from the Polish education actually I was exposed to. Um, so that was the last question. We've got one more short comment from the back. Hello, witam serdecznie. Katie Cole tutaj. Um, jestem brytyjski piosenkarka i miał, mam okazję 
Czy mam po, po, mówić po polsku czy po angielsku? He doesn't speak either English. There are some. English, okay. Um, I'm Katie Carr, a British songwriter, and I have a really, I'm really grateful that I'm here. This is just rather a comment. Um, I'd like to say that I think what you've been saying about showing history in a new light is really important for today. And here in Polonia, um, it's very important for the children and the students to learn history in a new, stimulating way. And in the last year, um, I managed to take 2,000 children of non-Polish descent through a whole series of workshops which accentuated Polish history in Enfield. And what I'd like to say is, you know, especially we've got so much to be proud of um, with our Polish roots and our Polish history, and especially with the next year, with the 70th um, anniversary and commemoration of Wojtek, um, the story of the soldier bear, especially with the Warsaw Uprising 70th anniversary coming up, the, se the 75th anniversary, the beginning of the Second World War, we have a lot of things that children can be stimulated. And what I'm finding is actually sharing my music and my songs with the children in a very basic way by singing and taking the children through uh, a section of showing archive footage with the songs, and especially with this album Passport that I've made, is a very stimulating thing for the children and I'm very much looking forward to doing a lot more outreach for children of Polish descent and of non-Polish descent in the next year. So I'd like to say thank you very much. Yeah. The best of good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much for the fruitful discussion. Let me thank you once more, and I think we all thank Dr. Mikołaj Kunicki for an inspiring lecture. Thank you very much on behalf of Tom. And if you could uh, still spare a few minutes uh, for me, I would like to present you with two initiatives that are upcoming. Uh, in our center. Mm. The next slide uh, will show. Um, in less than two weeks, we will have a conference organized in cooperation with the University College London uh, School of uh, East European and Slavonic Studies uh, on hum uh, do the humanities uh, have a nationality. So if you would like to have more information, please do uh, contact me. And I've got a very good news. Uh, that was the ninth Jagiellonian lecture, and the tenth Jagiellonian lecture will take place on the 7th of December. Uh, our guest will be uh, Dr. Antoni Libera, an acclaimed and well-known uh, interpreter and translator uh, from, uh, for example, of, of uh, Samuel uh, Beckett's works. So you are cordially invited to the next Jagiellonian lecture, and thank you very much for coming here. And now uh, I think there is time for an informal networking. We invite you for some refreshments downstairs. Thank you very much, and good evening.